Hey, welcome to Socialism for All. Today's date is March 19, 2021. And in this video, I'm going to be responding to the very commonly made populist argument that it's not about left versus right, it's about up versus down, or it's about the people versus the elites, or the establishment, or something to that effect. As socialists, we want to get a lot more specific when describing the conflict that's going on in society, which is a class conflict. And we shouldn't accept this populist framing. So I'm going to go into the reasons why. And in particular, I'm going to pick a video by Kim Iverson in which she makes this claim. She is coming from kind of like a right-wing leaning populist uh, type of position. I say that because I did a lengthier video about Kim Iverson a couple of weeks ago. Before we get into that, if you like this video, click the like button and the subscribe button and consider supporting us on Patreon. There's a link in the description. Okay, so before we get into the video, and I will play it momentarily, I just want to expand on what I said about being a socialist and really that the conflict that we're in in society, and there's a significant conflict going on, which working people need to pick a side in immediately and start fighting that this conflict is a class conflict. So, as Marx said a very long time ago, going on two centuries ago, the world under capitalism gets divided into two major classes. This is just the natural progression of the consolidation of wealth under capitalism. Due to the logic of capitalism, the way that the laws work around property, property relations in capitalism, the logic is that as time goes on, you get one class which owns everything called the capitalist class or the bourgeoisie, the ruling class in capitalism. And then you get a dispossessed class which owns nothing but their labor. That's the only commodity that they have to trade is labor. This is the proletariat, the working class, and this is the ruled or oppressed class opposite of the capitalist class, which is the ruling class. So bourgeoisie and proletariat, workers and owners, capitalists and labor. Okay, so what about the middle class? I hear some of you saying, well, in capitalism, primarily, there are two classes. However, there's a small middle class, petty bourgeoisie. These are people who do own something, but they are not big capitalists. They are small business owners, they are landlords that own like a building or two or three, that kind of thing. But they're not the Koch brothers or Koch brothers. They are not J.P. Morgan. They are not the Rockefellers, etc. You know, they're not Jeff Bezos. These people uh, do control a little bit of wealth. If we have the 99% and the 1%, these people are kind of more like the 10%. Um, you know, small employers, small landlords, things like that. People who may or may not work. Some small business owners, for example, are the only employee of their business. Others have employees, but they work alongside their employees, basically doing pretty much the same work. Others may just hire managers and pop in a day or two a week, you know, just to do consulting. And then other small business owners, you know, may just have I don't know, two or three million dollars of net worth, and they just hire managers, and they really don't do any work. They leave that up to their managers, and uh, they are not really working in that sense. But they're still not Jeff Bezos, big capitalists. You know, they don't own a huge empire, etc. And uh, you know, even in a downturn, they could get wiped out. But basically, we have two large classes. However, it is key the role of that uh, middle class for as long as it lasts, and it is shrinking increasingly more and more, especially now in the pandemic situation, many small businesses are going out of business. There's no uh, policies really but from either the Republican or Democratic Party in the United States uh, aimed at sort of recreating a middle class. There's just this sort of untrammeled stampede towards consolidation of wealth into the hands of a very few. So this is creating enormous hardship. Uh, people don't like being dispossessed, especially in a country where the petty bourgeoisie or small capitalists previously really had sided with the capitalists. 
So there's a lot of reaction going on, and uh, people don't know what to do. Let's play the Kim Iverson clip as she attempts to state from a populist perspective, it's more of a right-wing perspective, not a socialist perspective. Once upon a time, like really a long time ago in the late 19th century, before socialism really took off, there was a populist movement that you could say was more grassroots. Really, though, since the 20th century, since the very prominent rise of socialism, people still clinging to populism tend to be anti-socialist and anti-proletariat. They're more petty bourgeois and more right-wing than we socialists are. There tends to be that explicit rejection of socialism, and we also know that this just isn't an accurate political philosophy or orientation. It leads to being manipulated by the capitalists. All right, here's Kim. The two sides that are out there are not left and right. Like we've been gaslit into believing the two sides are the people versus the establishment. And the establishment is very clearly on both sides of the aisle. Okay, let's pause it here. Kim has now thrown out a bunch of terms that I think we need to unpack a little bit because depending on where you're coming from, what she said or parts of what she said could be considered true and then other parts false, and then if you define the terms differently, other parts will be true and other parts would be false. So I guess let's get to the part that I agree with first. So it's not about left and right. I think that was the opening statement. Well, the way that left and right are presented in the corporate media, those are not really accurate standards of political left and political right. So let's start with that. Um, basically, if you look at a CNN or a Fox or something like that, they say that the Democratic Party of the United States is left and that the Republican Party of the United States is right wing. This couldn't be a less accurate framing. So and then um, the, there will be a number of social issues that are assigned to each of those parties, and therefore that are considered left-wing or right-wing in, you know, popular political discourse, at least political discourse that is constrained by that corporate media, you know, big capitalist media framing. Um, they want you to see the Republican as the right and the Democrats as the left and really nothing else exists, or if it does, it's, you know, very fringe, insignificant, etc., it's not fringe or insignificant. In fact, we're going to be doing a video, I think, later today about how roughly two-thirds of people in the United States don't feel that either the Democrats or the Republicans represent them well. Well, then clearly this version of ascribing left to the Democrats and right to the Republicans is nonsense and not representative of how people actually think. So responding to Kim, it's not about left or right in the sense that it's not about Republican versus Democrat, I agree, because both of these parties represent the military-industrial complex and other large capitalist imperialist interests. Basically, they're, they're both imperialist parties, okay? Uh, they represent the same economic interests, which, first and foremost, is the big capitalists. They are both parties of the bourgeoisie that hate and mercilessly attack the proletariat. All of their policies are geared towards favoring the bourgeoisie or big capitalists. And then pretty much everyone else gets left behind. Now, the Republican Party is starting to take more of a petty bourgeois sort of overt embrace of the petty bourgeoisie. Uh, I believe that this is a step towards fascism. We'll explain what I mean by that later. Fascism here not meaning censorship or a lot of imperialism. It's a specific stage in which the capitalist class enlists the petty bourgeoisie to help attack the proletariat really severely. Okay, so that being on left and right, if we're going by the capitalist media standards, no, it's not about left versus right. So I agree with that. On the other hand, if we talk about actual standards of left versus right, basically the political spectrum that I use is in 2021, 
if you are defending capitalism in any form, whether you really like the exact status quo or you want to reform it slightly but keep capitalism, meaning private ownership of industry for profit, I put you on the right. Now, you might be, you know, the difference between liking things the way that they are, wanting them to be more brutal, or wanting them to be less brutal, you know, might determine whether you're center-right, like a social Democrat that wants Medicare for all. They'd be more center-right, maybe even just close to center. But you'd be on the, the right side of that center line in 2021. That's my opinion with the way that things are, how much society has come unraveled. If you're still for capitalism, you're a right winger, period. You might be center right. You might be far right if you're like a libertarian where it just, you know, can't be brutal enough ever. OK, you're far right. You're like a neo-feudalist. But that you're, you're on the right side of that dividing line. And if you want to end capitalism, you're on the left side. You're a socialist. So basically, I like to keep it pretty simple. And I feel that by now, things should be pretty simple. If you haven't gotten, but you know, with the, the way that contradictions have been heightened, if you haven't gotten it by now, um, with the mountains of evidence all around us, you know, sorry, but you're on the, the right side of that line. And then again, like I said, socialism, anything that wants to abolish capitalism, you're on the left side. This is more of a hazy theoretical space. So as far as saying who is far left, who is center left, I mean, at this point, I don't care because we're not on the left side of that line right now politically in terms of who has power. So I think that what we need is a big coalition of everyone who wants to end capitalism, as long as you actually want to end it. Not the rad libs who pretend to be radical, but in fact are liberal liberal in the sense of supporting capitalism. But really, anybody who sincerely wants to end capitalism, you're on the left side of the line. I believe we actually should all work together. Now, the problem with the Sockdem gang, they don't want to, they're capitalists. They don't want to end capitalism. So it's not about left versus right. Well, to some, no, not the way that the capitalist media presents it. It's not about Democrat versus Republican. That actually captures very little of the political spectrum. So I agree, it's not about that. But I disagree. I'd say it actually really is about left versus right. You just have to define them correctly. And again, I define them as left equals socialism, right equals capitalism. Because that is the conflict that we face. It's capitalists versus proletarians, dispossessed laborers, and with a little bit of a middle class shrinking all the time due to capitalism in between. And again, we'll get more later to the pivotal role that that middle class tends to play in determining the balance of power. Okay. So Kim also went here into a couple of other terms, the establishment. What does that mean? I'm going to go on record here and say that the establishment is a term that social Democrats, who basically just want to reform capitalism, that they use because they can't say capitalist class, because they don't want to promote a class-conscious view of society, politics, all of it. They say establishment, whereas we would say capitalists. Capitalists are the people who have the power. They have the economic power because they literally own industry. They legally own the means of production, factories, power plants, all of that stuff. It's in private hands. It's operated for profit. They take the goods and services produced by their employees. They turn them into commodities, which are exchangeable for money. And they keep all those commodities as their private property. They can't possibly use them personally. But they take them, they store them, they exchange them, and then they sell them back to the people who created them at a profit. What we as socialists want to do is break that control, decommodify production. In other words, just produce goods and services for use because people need them. Okay, we own the means of production collectively, publicly. We're going to produce a good or service. Here, you who needs that good or service, here, take it. 
It's our stuff. It's our labor. We're sharing it. And that society figures out exactly how they will produce, distribute, and share it. That's up to them. So there's another term that Kim used as the opposite of the establishment, the people. Okay, well, this is the you know base, basic element of populism. The people. Who are the people? Well, by implication, the people are everyone who isn't the establishment, which is not clearly defined. Okay. So, again... The highlighting some of the differences between populism and socialism, contrasting the superior specificity, the, the precision of the socialist class-based analysis. It's the people who own the means of production exploiting the people who don't. That's what the whole system of capitalism is more or less about. It has a number of repercussions. One of the main ones is alienation. The people who don't own the means of production, have to work for the people who do, and they become alienated from their own labor power, which is normally a sense of, gives you a sense of power and pride that you're using your creative labor power to do things, to solve problems in your life. Yet in capitalism, it gets taken away from you, and it actually, your own labor power is used to enslave you. So Marx wrote a lot about that. We're going to be doing a series on alienation later in uh, 2021. Right now, we're still laying down some of the basics here. So what Kim has said is it's not about left versus right. It's about people versus the establishment. And that the establishment is on both sides of the aisle, left and right. Okay. So here we have this closing thought of that the establishment, in quotes, uh, plays both Republican and Democratic hands. So this, again, sort of echoes or mirrors what, what I said before about, from a socialist perspective, the policies of both the Democratic and Republican Party favor the capitalist class, the big capitalists, who they're kind of trying to say are the establishment, sort of. But I don't want to give them that much credit because really they're saying establishment is they're trying to take the energy that we socialists have in saying the capitalist class without really endorsing our worldview. They're trying to corrupt and co-opt it, basically in service of just reforming capitalism. Or worse, this can also be used for fascism. That is worse than <laughs> just reforming capitalism to make it a more of a class piece, like a little bit more worker-friendly. Fascism is well, more radically anti-worker. Let's go on with the video. Firmly entrenched, deeply entrenched, you have Republican establishment and you have Democrat establishment. That is, that's who we're up against. It's the people versus the establishment. It's not left and right, but they've got us gaslit into believing it's this left-right you know, you're not on my side. I hear this all the time. Well, I thought you were on my side, but it turns out, you know, you have some right wing talking points. So therefore you're not on my side. Okay. So pausing Kim, it's kind of funny that she made this uh, complaint, which she does many times that people call her a right winger a whole lot. Well, again, in my previous video on Kim, we went into that in some detail. Um, no one really calls me a right winger. So I think if you are left wing, but people call you a right winger, you're doing something wrong. Definitely. Definitely. Uh, it shouldn't, it should be fairly easy of, to avoid that. It shouldn't really be something that you're running into. So, and specifically Kim Iverson is using, it's not about left or right as a defense specifically for introducing right wing talking points into what otherwise people might be looking for as a left-wing agenda, if you follow me. In other words, people who are tired of Democrat and Republican and the associated media outlets that you know speak in favor of the Democratic and Republican parties come to alternative media wanting something more left-wing because, really, if you want something more right-wing, um, I don't know what to tell you. It doesn't actually get much more right wing than the Republican Party in particular. Uh, both parties are right wing. The Republican is extremely far right, now developing an explicitly 
white nationalist fascist branch of itself uh, in the MAGA movement. That's really con like right now in the development of being processed. So Kim saying that it's not about left versus right. This is a very self-serving move on her part. Now, is it just because of her own grift, her own media channel? I mean, when I say grift, her own particular interests as a media personality trying to make a living running her channel. Uh, or, you know, is she doing this in service of some larger political group? I'm not aware of her having been affiliated with any particular political group at this point. She has said fairly recently she's not, for example, associated with the movement for a People's Party and has expressed disdain for the Green Party, so is not affiliated with either of those. And uh, again, in her interview with Graham Elwood, she goes on about how people are, you know, always calling her a right-winger. Well, so when we hear people making this argument, this tracks again with what I said before about how maybe in the 1880s, if you said you were a populist, that could really be a left-wing expression. However, after socialism got established, that became the standard of if you're on the left, hey, we have a well-developed system here. It's called socialism. We have a highly refined class analysis that really can take us beyond capitalism into the future. If you were still clinging to populism at that point, it's because you're a capitalist, period. You're just not very left-wing. But let's go on and let Kim continue to explain you know, what she means by how she sees herself in this system that is not about left versus right, but, you know, people versus establishment. No, I'm on your side if you're the people. I'm not on your side if you are the establishment. Okay, so, <laughs> again, there are fairly objective criteria in socialism for who is a proletarian, who is petty bourgeois, who is bourgeois. We know where the sides are, with some objectivity. How do we know if, am I in the people or am I with the establishment? Where are the boundaries? They're much more vague. Kim's logic actually is self-defeating here. When she says, I mean, she's kind of contradicting, well, it's bad logic to begin with, but basically she's saying that someone in her audience says, hey, Kim, I don't like what you're saying. It's right wing. I thought you were with me. And she's like, well, if you're in the people, I'm on your side. Okay, but I just said that you're not with me because I don't like what you're saying. <laughs> so how does that work? There's not really an answer. It's just sort of this circular logic of like, if you agree with me, <laughs> you're the people. We don't want that. This is not good. You know, we do need in any movement to criticize behavior and ideas. If you have ideas that are this vague, they can't really be criticized. And again, it just becomes this shifting battle of allegiances and loyalty about, you know, who are the people and are you going to be included in that definition of the people? Not on an objective basis, as socialists want to do, but according to the whims of populist demagogues, who can shape the definitions of who are the people at a, at a whim, you know, based on their needs as the grifters that they are. People who are riding a wave of popular sentiment, of dissatisfaction with the status quo towards a very uncertain future at least uncertain to them, in their political ideology. We as socialists can tell you where it's headed. You can't reform capitalism. This is reactionary in the sense that it's trying to turn back the wheel of history. In a way, it just won't go. You can pull it back with some effort for a while. Ultimately, it goes bad, and progress wants to go forward. What does this mean? It means that property laws under capitalism lead to one thing, consolidation of capital, proletarianization of the working and middle classes. People who do not own capital, like in a big, big way, aren't in that tiny 1% or 0.1%. 
They get proletarianized. You become dispossessed and you, you know, eventually are reduced to the status where the only thing you have to trade with to make your way in the world is your labor. That's where you end up. Populists want to ride dissatisfaction with capitalism towards a modified version of capitalism, which is ultimately unstable and does not lead to anything lasting in the way that socialism actually paves the way for a permanent replacement of capitalism. Let's go on. That is it. We might have genuine disagreements with one another. We might be able to hash those out through conversation. But we cannot even do that if the establishment is continually in control of Washington. You know, uh, Billy Bob, who voted for Trump, who's trying to make it in the middle of in the middle of Arkansas or Idaho, that is your enemy. That's what you're honestly thinking. That person is your enemy. That person's not robbing you of all your wealth. That person isn't regulating and, and taking your taxes and then giving it to corporations. That's not what Billy Bob in Idaho is doing. Okay, here Kim makes a vague and fallacious argument to the extent that it has any clarity at all. It is fallacious. So she says that random voter who she has named Billy Bob, not to be like stereotyping or anything, voted for Trump, but Billy Bob, the voter who voted for Trump, is not your enemy because he's not in Washington. It's like such a classic populist. And the fat cat's in Washington. But because he's not a fat cat in Washington, isn't your enemy because he's not taking your tax money and giving into corporations or whatever. Okay. As socialists, we always want to ask the question, for which class? What are the class interests involved? Because that will oftentimes tell you a lot. Also, people can have what Marx referred to as false consciousness. In other words, they're not conscious of their own class interests, but they have fallaciously wrongly, incorrectly, identified the capitalist class's interests with their own. A good expression of this is the old aphorism that a rising tide lifts all boats. This is the capitalist's way of saying, when the capitalists get rich, we all get richer. Well, no, that's just simply not true. It's wrong. It's propaganda. So, but people who fall for that and then wind up opposing socialism in fact, at least at that moment, are the enemy of socialists. I mean, they're self-declared enemies of socialists. How can you say that they're not our enemy when they're saying that they're our enemy? When they're saying, you, I know your ideology, whether they do or not, I know your ideology and I hate it. I oppose it. And then you're going to say this person isn't our enemy. They just literally, they're, they're aiming at you. How, is, how are they not our enemy? How do you go to a MAGA rally and listen to all the things that Trump would say? For example, Trump just being one example, a very prominent and um, almost a kind of perfect form in the moment, you know, the epitome at this particular time, the, the avatar of the transition from proto-fascism into an actual full-fledged fascist movement, I would say, we're getting right around the border how do you take somebody who goes to those rallies and agrees that, yeah, it's the immigrants and the socialists and every other classic fascist talking point, and then say, well, those people aren't our enemies because they're just confused working class people. They're just confused proletarians. Well, first of all, a lot of them are actually petty bourgeois. So there's that. Now, to a populist, that doesn't really matter because they don't have the same class-based perspective. They aren't Marxists. They haven't studied how all of this goes. They just want, well, they're more reactionary. They just want to turn capitalism back to a point where their class was doing a little bit better. That's not what we as socialists want. We don't want to turn things back to where proletarians were doing better because proletarians, by definition, were never doing better. I mean, the definition of a proletarian is, some, is a worker who is dispossessed. I mean, what we're trying to do is say that as technology progresses to a point where labor 
becomes less skilled. We become not handcrafts people, but button pushers, lever pullers. And then the step beyond that that we're going into now with the fourth industrial revolution, AI, where just machines do it, maybe we have to put the machine in a particular place and then press the on button, at least for now, till the machines actually can build and operate other machines on their own. But uh, we're getting to a point where labor is just not as valued and skilled. I mean, I sort of conflated those two, but skilled labor is not as valued or needed. It's in some ways redundant human labor. Not always, and there will always be some areas where human labor is just going to be more apt and appropriate, probably at any level of technology. Uh, probably at any level of technology, that is, we will not have a machine that can do everything. The idea that we would is sort of a theoretical point in the more distant future. Anyway, between now and then, there's always some role for human labor. But do we need billions of workers doing all of this stuff always? Well, we need fewer and fewer as time goes on. The idea is that you can't fight proletarianization, nor do we want to. The idea is that we make prolet being a proletarian not that bad. Under capitalism, being a proletarian is awful, Right? But in socialism, where the proletariat rules, we create a society where being a proletarian is fine, good, and comfortable, where it's not a threat. It's only a threat because of capitalism. But in a world, in a society that is governed by the proletarian class, by the working class, we just create a society that doesn't have private property. So that, yes, you are dispossessed on a personal level, but you have so much publicly available wealth that it doesn't matter. You're sharing things in common. So that's the key thing that capitalism keeps away from us, is the ability to share in what we've created. Because the capitalists privatize it all in the hands and in the name, legally, of a very few people. So what we're trying to do is not to roll it back to where the middle class had a greater share of the wealth before the capitalists consolidated their wealth under their names. Because that's what the middle class wants. That's what the petty bourgeoisie wants. They, they want to roll it back to where their little shop was doing better or whatever. Or when, you know, taxes weren't so high on the whatever. They, they want to just roll it back to a few decades ago or, you know, whenever they perceive, well, make America great again. There you go. Whenever it is you think America was doing better, Trump's fighting for that, says this, you know, pseudo-populist. I mean, I say pseudo-populist. It's kind of all populism now is pseudo-populism because really all that happens is you get manipulated by the big bourgeoisie who the big bourgeoisie, like Marxists, know you can't go backwards. They see themselves getting richer and richer and richer over time. And they know it's going to keep going that way. And they also know that if the middle class sides with them against the working class, then they're safe. If the middle class sides with the proletarians, knowing that, hey, we're probably going to end up as proletarians, we, you know, that's our future interest, we should ally with them, then you know, the capitalists are in significantly more risk of being deposed. So... Again, populism, reactionary, trying to turn back the wheel of history, which just, that's the nature of capitalism. It doesn't go backwards. Socialists recognize this, and we want to create a future, not recreate a past, but create a new future where it is simply more comfortable to be a proletarian. Moving back to Kim's ignorant rant. As much as you might think he's the giant threat, he is not your threat. And these progressives have not seemed to wrap their minds around that. So, and I've seen this not just with the progressives that, that you know, obviously were voted in uh, into the House, but also just progressive commentators. We've seemed, a lot, we've seemed to have lost sight of what the progressive movement is. It is to fight the establishment, not join it. I don't even really know what she's talking about here. Um, I mean... <laughs> Again, it's these vague terms, the establishment, are you joining the establishment or not? She talked about progressives who have been voted in the House. I mean, that's a level of naivete. I just, I don't entirely know where she's coming from. 
She's talking about the squad and people like that. I mean, as Marxists, while of course we want to hope for the best that these people are in fact, you know, insurgents who have cleverly disguised themselves as, you know, run-of-the-mill new faces of imperialism, the fact is that uh, it's not a mask. They just are new faces of imperialism, people like AOC and Ilan Omar. They know the progressive talking points. And then in, in reality, they are uh, actually just in a bourgeois political party working for the bourgeoisie. At the end of the day, that's the effect that it has. What we know from socialist history is that you need a socialist political party, which the Democratic Party is not, never will be. In fact, it's a vehemently anti-socialist party. Thinking you can join that party and not get dragged to the right, like, think about it. Just in Congress, you have like hundreds of Congress people who more or less represent the status quo. And then you have like five or six who say that they're going to drag those hundreds of people left. Which is honestly more likely, that they're going to get pulled right or that they're going to pull a mass which is, you know, 50 times their size in their direction? Think about it. So um, as for the rest of what Kim is saying, I just, uh, it doesn't make a ton of sense. I think there's just not a lot of substance here. Again, populists, because unlike Marxists, unlike socialists, they don't really have an objective frame of reference. It's just, we're the people. Is it reactionary enough, you know, to suit your particular flavor of like how, what you think the paradise years were of social democracy or whatever? As socialists, we want the absolute emancipation of labor from capital, period. We want to end capitalism. We want to end the commodification of goods and services. We want a different system of production. We want a different mode of production, socialism, in which industry is collectively owned and operated not for profit, but to meet human need for use. These are objective standards. They're attainable. We need to fight for that. A revolution, a change in the ruling class, Reforms can be accepted along the way. Sometimes reforms are useful. Sometimes the calls for reform can be useful even if they're not achieved because you can demonstrate to people that the system can't even reform itself. And sometimes that's useful. But ultimately, we are looking for a revolutionary change. Any reforms really just need to be in service of that because capitalism is the crisis. It has built-in crises of overproduction built into it. It has misery built into it. The less regulated it is, the more pronounced those crises are. It's strikingly underregulated right now compared to even just past standards of the 20th century. Of course, those past standards of 20th century capitalism were developed in a world where the threat of socialism was arguably a much more pressing one. And so capitalists were like looking at, for example, the USSR and saying, who oh, there's a new kid on the block. We got a, we got some competition for our just economic system and we've got to compete. Then since in particular the early nineties, when the Soviet union was destroyed, they were like, Oh, Unipolar world for capitalism. Let's globalize. We got globalization in the 90s. And this whole push of liberalization or reversion to capitalism began. We're, you know, 30 years into that globalized economy. Part of it was the internet technology and communications tech, but a lot of it was Soviet Union broke up and capitalism has been unchecked for a while. So the capitalist order is particularly cocky right now in terms of feeling like it doesn't need to really listen at all. So we're getting this big jam up politically of massive discontent is piling up and people who aren't socialists like Kim Iverson feeling a need to weigh in and um, 
you know, they want to represent their own, look at me, I'm special, petty bourgeois interests. That, again, it's just not substantial. When you really try to pin these people down on what they're looking for, none of them really agree. There will be a few points, but they're not pushing for one particular new system to come into place. Let's finish off her little piece here. I think there's just one clip left. The establishment is robbing us. The establishment is is ruining our chance at an American dream. We are more riddled in debt. We can't afford basic things like education and health care. These are not luxuries. No one's asking to be driving around in a Lamborghini and asking for taxpayer money for it. Okay, so that's the end of the clip. We'll 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 stop there because I think you get the point. Um, the American dream. What is it? It was always a lie. It was a way that the capitalists who always knew which way the system was going to go, more and more consolidation of the wealthy and more and more immiseration and proletarianization of everyone else. But they sold you this American dream of regulated capitalism, the golden years of the 1930s through the 1970s, social democracy, where there were more social programs and there was more compression of inequality. There was less, you know, less of a range of, of inequality. The gap between the haves and the have-nots or the capitalists and the workers was not quite as wide. And this American dream was that you could be a working person and still, you know, have this comfortable life that came to be known as middle class as a working person who maybe, you know, really didn't own any capital, but you could still live comfortably, easily buy a house, easily raise a family, all that kind of stuff. I mean, that was their alternative to the socialist vision. It was always a paper-thin deception that they only maintained for as long as they needed to politically. As soon as the Soviet Union in particular came down, because China at that time was very poor, late 80s, early 90s, they were struggling. Um, you know, the capitalists just didn't see any more competition. So they were like, fuck that American dream shit, whatever. And you see, well, even earlier with the peak of the labor movement in the U.S. around 1960, you see a drop in living standards in the 70s and 80s. So even before that, um, you know, they were the capitalists became more vicious against labor unions. Labor unions being a, a key piece of a socialist movement. We talked today in 2021 about rebuilding resistance to capital. Uh, step one, labor unions. It's very hard to start a labor union, but by all means, try. Labor unions have been the backbone of virtually every socialist movement ever. It's a key, key, key thing. And we don't really have it. They've been on the decline all across the industrialized imperialist countries. Need labor unions for a successful socialist movement. On that note, I'm going to leave it here. Hopefully this has been an informative take or video on contrasting socialism and populism. We'll be coming back to this theme because even on the so-called Marxist left, I see people making this argument that we can embrace right-wing populists. While we certainly need to reach out to and appeal to people who aren't currently Marxists, it doesn't mean that our ideologies are just compatible. They're not. They're not. You need conversion, not just trying to mix these things. It's not going to work you're going to wind up with a horrible product. So on that note, thanks for watching. We're going to go to the credits. And that's the video. Thanks to our current patrons whose names are on the screen. If you'd like to get your name on the screen or just support us financially, you can go to patreon.com slash socialism for all and sign up for a monthly donation. You can also follow us at facebook.com slash socialism. The number for all used to have a page at F O R all and it got throttled to death by Zuck. Here on YouTube, please click the like button, subscribe button, and the notifications bell. 
please leave a comment if you can, and please share our video wherever you're online, your Twitter feed, your Discord servers, Reddit subs, etc. All of that helps more people to see this content, whether it's in the YouTube algorithm or just posting it on other sites. All of that's helpful. All of you out there supporting and promoting this content makes it all go that much more smoothly. We need to end capitalism, normalize talking about socialism today, and uh, it's really kind of our only hope for a better tomorrow. Thanks for all you do, and we will catch you in the next video.